Last year I did a video entitled the top five mistakes nonprofits make year end and it was very well received. If you didn't watch that video click the link above and watch it after this video. Today I'm going to be doing a next top five mistakes made a year end video. Watch until the end to see if you're making any of these mistakes and how to correct those errors. Let's get going. Some years back I heard a story of a woman who had inherited a large estate at the passing of her husband. Not long after she became ill and was hospitalized. She was actively involved in a large church and the senior pastor knowing that she had no children felt the church would stand to gain a large portion of that estate at her passing. He visited her every day and the two prayed together and sang hymns. The pastor was even present when she passed on to be with her Savior. After the reading of her will, the pastor discovered that she left her entire estate to her husband's alma mater. He was incredulous. He contacted the college and found out that a development officer came to visit her just two days before her death and asked her for a gift in honor of her husband. He asked. That's all he did. He asked. The pastor spent all that time with the woman and never once thought to ask. He learned a valuable lesson that day and I learned one as well. And that set the tone for my first mistake addressed in this video. In all the cases listed there's an easy fix if and when it's made. Mistake number one. Not doing a year-end appeal. It never ceases to amaze me how often I hear a nonprofit organization who don't, doesn't employ a year-end strategy. They make a conscious decision not to do anything because they're too busy and it's too complicated. This is a critical mistake. I've mentioned that 51% of the income received by the average nonprofit comes at the end of the year. So by not asking you are potentially missing the opportunity to double your income for the next year. But an appeal is not just for organizations needing more money. It can even be for those who have enough or are doing well. A colleague once shared some words of wisdom. You want to build in times of strength to weather the times of need. Even if all this does is to help you build a reserve, don't miss the opportunity. I realize that there is labor involved in this effort and you may run a small nonprofit, perhaps with little money and few staff, but that's no excuse to meet an opportunity to get some hefty income during the most fruitful giving season of the year. Writing a letter can be intimidating but don't try to eat the elephant all at once. It can be eaten one bite at a time. Sit down and write a letter just as if you were writing to a friend. Include the following ingredients. Explain the problem that exists that caused your organization to be started in the first place. Explain how you go about solving the problem. And finally, explain what could be achieved with a very generous gift at year end. And I mean the outcomes and not just the outputs. Remember, outputs are the stats and figures and outcomes are the lives changed. That means you need to include at least one good story in your letter. Begin with the goal to at least write a one page letter. If it goes to two pages in order for you to tell the story adequately, that's okay. Be sure to be specific in explaining what can be accomplished through their gift and give details about the opportunity. Make sure to clearly ask for the most generous gift possible at your end and ask for an exact dollar range like 100, 250 or even 500. Then print the letter even if it means you have to use someone else's computer or FedEx office. Don't attempt to send your letter to everyone on your mailing list. Start with the critical few. 
the 20% of the donors who give 80% of your income. Well, print the address of the donor on the outside of the envelope and avoid labels if possible and use an actual stamp, no meter or indicia. Just get over the hump that this task is too big to do at the busiest time of the year. Not doing it is worse than the time and effort to do it. Mistake number two, sending a letter that doesn't have a compelling hook and action-driven PS. In keeping with the method of mailing a letter, and by the way, the old-fashioned snail mail letter is still the method of choice among baby boomers, the most generous generation alive today. Emails and electronic appeals have not yet become the most popular way to present giving opportunities. Be sure to begin your letter with a compelling quote or powerful opening sentence and be sure to use a PS that summarizes the need and gives a call to action. For decades, studies have shown that there's only a few seconds to capture someone's attention before they stop reading and throw your letter away. And the two things that people read most frequently are the opening quote or sentence and PS. So, if you want to get someone to keep reading your letter, be sure that the opening is strong and the closing is informative and action-packed. If you use a compelling change life story from someone who has been impacted by your organization, and I highly recommend this, look for an impactful quote that can be brought to the top of the letter and used as a hook to get people into the letter. Something like, my life was a disaster and I was ready to end it all or I, re I had reached rock bottom with no place to turn or even can you show me how to know Jesus? All these put the reader into the story to find out what happens next and as tempting as it is to start your letter with a greeting during this holiday season, go with the rest of the story and explain how this life was changed as a result of being connected with your organization. Then explain why you're writing today. The PS in an appeal letter is not like a normal postscript. A PS in a good appeal letter summarizes the purpose and the letter, the opportunity and the steps involved in giving to your organization. And all this in two or three sentences maximum. Mistake number three, forgetting to tailor giving amounts to the donor's capacity. Without a doubt, a letter that includes suggested a dollar amounts does better than one that only suggests that people give whatever you can. Unfortunately, all studies show that people need help in understanding what's expected of them. Without suggested dollar amounts, they default to amounts lower than you want. People like to know your expectations of them. If you don't suggest a gift of $1,000, $2,500, or even $5,000, you might get a gift of $10, even from somebody who's extremely wealthy. It's been proven that within reason, you never lose by asking for amounts higher than their capacity or capability. They feel flattered that you felt their capacity was that high, and they often give more than what they originally intended to give. But it's important that you tailor your amounts to either past giving patterns or their ability to give a gift of that size. If someone's largest gift to your organization has been $25, you probably aren't going to ask them for $1,000. But asking them for $100 or $250 is definitely within reason. The same is true if someone has a history of giving $1,000 to your organization and you ask them for $100, you're going to greatly under-challenge them. Remember, people give what you expect of them. As much as you might think they will give $1,000 even if you ask for $100, it simply won't happen. Mistake number four, not including a response envelope and response form. Including a response envelope and response form might seem so basic or matter of fact, but I'm always surprised at how many letters I get that don't include a response form and even some that don't include a response envelope. There are nonprofit organizations that feel including a response form and envelope is a waste of time and money. 
that a donor can find their own envelope and that a form with an account designation for a project or program is unnecessary because every gift goes into one pool of money. However, the goal of any appeal, especially at this busy time of the year, is to make it as easy as possible for a donor to give. If we don't make it easy for them, they will find someone who does. Or, to put it another way, if we make it difficult to give, and I know no nonprofit does this intentionally, donors will gravitate to organizations who make it easy to give. Frankly, because of the size of the organization I represent, we haven't always made it easy for donors to give. In fact, some have even called it complicated. Donors have said to me, why don't you guys make it simple to give like XYZ does? Or can't you make it less complicated to give? That's a weakness that I continue to address. That's why including an envelope with a return address on the outside is a minimum. We don't want donors scrambling to find an envelope and worse yet, don't want them having to look up our address. Now, there have been debates about including a stamp on the return envelope that the cost is just not worth it. I understand completely and that's why I won't include a stamp or use an indicia on letters to my small donors. However, I'll frequently use a stamp on the return envelope to my larger donors, my critical few. First, because it will make it easier for them to give, not having to look for a stamp. But second, there are some people who don't want to throw away a stamp and will send at least something since we included a self-addressed stamped envelope. You will find that with critical few, it's worth the cost. There's another debate about the necessity to include a response form, especially if the money all goes into the same place. And I get that as well. But research bears out that people see using a response form as more professional and feel more confident that their gift is directed to the right place when they're asked to use a response form. And donor confidence is essential in the overall scheme of things. Confidence and ease of giving is essential. Mistake number five, not thanking the donor for a year-end gift. Not long ago, I heard a statistic that made me want to scream. 75% of nonprofit organizations never thank a dinner after getting a gift. I realize that many donors say they don't want to be thanked, but in reality, they love to be thanked. If nothing else, sending a thank you note or letter lets the donor know that you received their gift. But a good thank you will acknowledge the gift, but also give you an opportunity to reinforce the great decision they just made. And as the old adage goes, there is no one more ready to give a second gift than someone who's happy with the first. It allows you to share a story of a changed life often tied into the gift or tied into a gift like theirs. It allows you to share future plans for the gift and of course, the output, stats and data, and the outcome, lives change for eternity. There are many more mistakes, but those are for another video. If you have some mistakes that you've seen made and would like to share that with our Life Changers community, please drop those in the comments section below. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget to hit the like button and add a comment below if there was something that you especially liked. I'll be releasing more year-end videos between now and December 31st, so be sure to hit the subscribe button and click the bell to be notified when the next video is released. Remember, if you have fundraising questions, submit them on Twitter at DevFStrats and use the hashtag Jim and Java. On Instagram, go to Dev Effectiveness Strategies or email me at developmenteffectivenessm at gmail.com. If you want to find out what to say and how to say it during a meeting with a major donor, click this video and see your income soar. As always, I wish you the best. Did you strive? to increase your income and reach the goal of becoming fully funded. Thanks a lot. See you in the next video.